My name is Eugene Daniels. I am a White House correspondent and Politico Playbook co-author at Politico, um, MSNBC political analyst, and I'm currently the White House Correspondents Association board vice president. And in just a month, I will take over as president. I was born in New York, in Manhattan. We were there for like five months as a baby. Fort Hood is where I went to middle school and high school, where I graduated high school. Um, I spent the most time as a kid. Uh, I loved being a military brat. Me and my siblings got really close because we bounced around a lot. My dad spent a lot of time overseas. You know, every war essentially that happened from during my childhood that the United States was involved in, every peacekeeping mission, he was a part of that. He was in military intelligence. He went to Afghanistan and Iraq. He went to South Korea, Belize, all the Kosovo, all types of places all over the world. So that was the worst part of it. It's just being worried. From my dad, I learned, he, he pushed me to be in sports and athletics. And so I played football, all, and it surprises people because of the nail polish and the pink now. But <laughs> when I was um, much younger, I played football all the way up until college. I got 10 Division I scholarship offers. Got a full scholarship at Colorado State University and played football there as a defensive end. Um, and so my dad taught me the importance of teamwork. And for my mom, you know, she, my dad was deployed a lot, so she was the parent who was like at home the most. And I think watching her essentially operate as kind of like a single mom, you know what I mean, with my dad overseas, it taught me strength and perseverance, um, vulnerability. Um, and she told me and my siblings, you belong in every single room you find yourself in. And when I was a kid and she said that, I had no idea what she was talking about. But as I have grown up and, and done different things in my career, that is something I hold on to when I have to you know, walk into a room that was not created for people that look or love like me. I, that is something I take in there with me and remind myself that everyone in here is in here for some reason, and that includes me. And so that's something, I mean, chills, that's something that um, like I take from my mother the most. In my head as a kid, I wanted to be a lawyer, um, a politician, and I wanted to be the first black president. I went to school in 2007 and 2008. That's when I was a freshman. And so, you know, I got beat to the to that last goal, which is just fine. Um, and I was sitting in a class called the Politics of Special Interest Groups. I was hearing the kinds of things and the kind of sacrifices and moral sacrifices that politicians sometimes have to or choose to make um, when dealing with lobbyists. And I just knew that I couldn't do that. Like I just, it didn't, it didn't sit right with me. So I went to the teacher of that class who I'd really hit it off with. And I was like, just like, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what to do. Like this has been my goal since I was a kid. Like I was gonna be a politician. Um, and she said to me really simply, like as if it was like nothing, um, she said, maybe you don't want to be a powerful person. Maybe you want to hold powerful people accountable. You liked my class, didn't you? And so that just kind of clicked for me. When I sit down in front of a camera and, or when I sit down to write, I'm thinking about my grandmother in South Carolina on a fixed income. Um, she is retired. She worked her whole life. She went through a lot. And I feel at times, Political reporters, we can sometimes want to impress, and so we want to talk in a way that, you know, the Harvard and the Yales of the world um, understand that we are uh, a member of that crowd. I went to Colorado State University. I mean, I'm not a member of the Ivy League crowd. I'm from, my family's from Bucksport and Conway, South Carolina. You know, I grew up in the South. So I want the people who look like me um, to understand how important politics is to their everyday life. There's nothing more exciting than seeing like older black people in front of the White House running up to me and saying they love seeing me on TV, that they're proud of me. Um, those kinds of things are reminders that like, okay, yeah, the speaking plainly speaks to the people I wanna speak to. Well, I got married here, I met my husband here, so that's probably the number one highlight. Um, I also came out when I came to DC. And so I think that is also, has to be one of the biggest highlights because Pulse happened in 2016. And what I realized is that, wait, something could happen to me and my family won't know who I actually am. And that terrified me. 
Um, and so I decided that I was, you know what, I'm coming out. I'm going to do it. I am sick. I was 27. I was like, I'm sick of, you know, pretending like I'm going to settle down with a nice, very patient woman um, and have children. And I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. And um, I think that for me opened up so many things because once I came out, I all the space I had in my head that was being filled by making sure that if I looked at my nails, I didn't look like this, I looked like this. Because I read one time that only women and gay men look at their nails like this, which is not a thing. <laughs> but I had read it and so I always would like, look at, you know, do things like that. I would never put my hand on my hip or like put my hands on my knees and bend over. Embracing who I was gave me the space to just be and work and keep my head down and do the work and focus on um, what I wanted my career to look like. And so I could pay more attention to the opportunities as, as they came along. I get to cover the White House. I get to walk into the White House. I have a little badge, it beeps. You know, Secret Service lets me walk right in. Um, I think that and bringing my family with me on that, the ancestors with me when I go into that space is something. Um, because we all know that the White House was built by slaves and when you're you're on those grounds, at least when I'm on those grounds, like that is what I think about. Those are the people that I'm thinking about. My grandmother, who is still around in, in her late 80s, um, you know, she would have never imagined that and has told me like that anyone from our family would go on Air Force One. Oh my God, I'm gonna cry. Um, and, uh, you know, they give you this like little card that says your name on it like Mr. Daniels. So I keep those and I give them to my dad, right? And, you know, he said to me one time, like, you're taking our name, you know, on Air Force One. The president knows who you are. The vice president knows who you are. You, you know, you yell questions at them. You interview them. And I, um, I'm in that space because of the people that came before me, the um, queer people, the black people, the women who have paved the way to make it easier for me. Um, they did a lot more of the hard work. And so it is disrespectful, in my opinion, to them to not bring your full self, to not come to the table and own it as much as you possibly can and take up space. Oh my God, don't get me started. <laughs> I, I I could talk about her all day. I, in my when I say walking Beyonce's encyclopedia, like I mean that I'm obsessed. Um, probably too much for some of my friends and family. And Mama's been giving us everything we need over the last few years. So I am I have been in heaven as things have, have changed in my life. She's been giving me exactly what I need. I walk into the White House. I'm listening to Alien Superstar or Cozy or any Yaya from Cowboy Carter kind of like centering myself with, um, you know, some, some affirmations from the queen herself. The increased adversity for LGBTQ plus folks um, is something I never thought I'd see. I think I was a little naive. And what I deal with as kind of like a cisgender um, gay man in Washington, D.C., who is, you know, six foot three, plays football, don't, don't let the pink fool you, um, is nothing compared to what my 25-year-old gender non-conforming sibling deals with. It is nothing like the, what my um, Black trans brothers and sisters are dealing with around the world. And I think, you know, people both fear and want to attack what they don't understand. And there is not just a lack of understanding, there's a lack of wanting to understand. The outrage that is on that small group, to me, is outsized by the fact that they are more likely to commit suicide and leave this earth. And so, you know, that um, is a reminder that, you know, as we're celebrating Pride and we're all excited and, you know, we're gonna be out there and the shorts and the heels at Pride, that like there are reasons why we did this. And Pride was, you know, started as protests. And it started as um, a fight to be seen, to be heard, and to be allowed to be left alone and like live your life. And I think um, we can sometimes forget that in the excitement of, of Pride. And so it's important to remember that. I often think about, uh, you know, like National Coming Out Day, um, or during Pride, I'm thinking about like little Eugene who knew then, right? Like I knew then and how 
much I suppressed who I was and how long. If you can do it safely, do it early. If you need help, find it. Um, be kind to yourself. I think I was, I think all of, a lot of us who um, are older and, and as we're coming out or, or not, very mean to ourselves. Um, and to those who aren't a member of the, the community, like be gentle to us. And when you see kids who seem like they're dealing with that or they're being bullied for that, love on them and don't don't join that. Um, every time I talk to a young person, I give them my mom's advice and I'll say it again. You belong in every single room you find yourself in and take up space, love on yourself and love on each other. Holding powerful people accountable. Being yourself in spaces that you weren't supposed to be in and trying to keep the door open for everyone coming after. All of those sacrifices that my parents made, all of the people who poured love and support and um, assurance into me as a kid, like you you guys made a, you know, one, thank you, and two, it, it, has, it has paid off.